Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great uh, pleasure to uh, uh, welcome you to uh, Dr. Avinash Paliwal's uh, wonderful new book, My Enemy's Enemy. And if you haven't already bought one, uh, you're not allowed off the premises without buying one. Um, well, in this day and age, I have to say, oh, that was a joke. Um, uh, I also want to thank uh, Mohammed, um, uh, uh, <coughs> Richard, um, uh, uh, Raksha, and the rest of our team for helping put uh, on uh, this evening's uh, event, uh, which is uh, one of the first in uh, a CISD and SOAS's uh, um, menu. If you look on the, the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy's events page, you'll see uh, a uh, um, quite a, a star uh, cast of uh, lectures in the um, in the coming in the coming year. Uh, the centre itself is um, a small part of the uh, of the Great Soas Empire. We have some uh, 400 um, uh, mostly master students. We're a postgraduate uh, teaching centre, masters and uh, doctoral students. Some 400 students and uh, some 350 of those are studying all over the world as we speak as part of our online programs, which we uh, deliver in association uh, with the British Foreign Ministry's Diplomatic Academy, which is very good news uh, until you look at the state of uh, British diplomacy today. Uh, and then you, from my perspective, I guess I'll be long gone, but in 15 years' time, I guess you'll be able to partly blame us for British diplomacy uh, as we have this, uh, the te this teaching role now. Uh, but uh, I'm also particularly delighted that uh, Avinash uh, joined us relatively recently to help uh, lead one of these programs uh, with the, the Diplomatic Academy. And uh, uh, no sooner had he arrived than uh, this, uh, this book emerged. Uh, I have to say, I find it to be a, a satisfyingly uh, uh, factually dense uh, analysis of um, the relationship between uh, uh, India and Afghanistan uh, in particular. I had uh, some years when I was uh, working in the international news media after the um, unpleasantness of 9-11 and the events flowing, and it was just impossible to get uh, a discussion of events in Afghanistan to bring any panel discussion on Western television to say, well, of course, another country engaged here is uh, India, <laughs> and has been for some time. It was not something that uh, even, uh, say, The Guardian um, uh, could uh, bring into its, uh, its scope of, uh, of analysis. So as we're launching this uh, South Asian uh, um, program with the foreign ministry, having uh, Avinash to not only bring a rounded view of the region, but uh, a particularly uh, sophisticated analysis of this critical uh, dimension uh, in the region uh, was something which we were delighted to be able to, to welcome to, to SOAS. So that's my, uh, my pitch as Centre Director. I'm now under strict instructions to disappear, uh, which I will uh, now do into the body of the hall, uh, but we're not without um, uh, uh, recognising and asking uh, Mr. Michael Dwyer of Hearst Publishers to come up and say a few words about uh, the publisher's view of this book. So, Michael, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Yansh Sinha, uh, thank you all first for attending this event. We're very grateful to have such strong support. Thanks also to Dan and to, um, to Professor Ed Simpson and the SOAS South Asia Institute for hosting this. I think their new lecture series looks, as Dan said, mouth-watering, and we aim to add some further speakers to their spring season with their permission. Um, Hearst publishes about 90 books a year, and of those, we publish about 10 or 15 on South Asia and South and Southwest Asia. We have a strong interest in uh, working with SOAS. I was a student here longer ago than I care to remember. We've been publishing authors here for at least 45 years, and still do, so that's uh, a connection we wish to maintain. We're particularly delighted to be publishing this book by Dr. Palawal. Um, I'm personally interested in India's bilateral relations 
And I'd long thought that this was a, you know, a yawning chasm in the literature on, on South Asian studies and, and, and politics. Uh, we are about to sign a book at Hearst by a former Indian diplomat on India-Russia relations since uh, probably the late 1940s to the present. I'm on the lookout for someone to do a book about India-Japan relations over the last 30, 40 years. If you know anyone, email me. I'd like to talk to them. Um, we, I mean, we are also delighted to be publishing this book. No pressure, Abhinash, because of the advanced praise it has received. Um, we expect it to become the key text for understanding India-Afghan relations for many years. I doubt anyone else is going to do a better job than Abhinash anytime soon. And we anticipate, anticipate that it will be read closely, particularly in South Block, in Whitehall, and within the Beltway, and deservedly so. We really do need to make our decisions on these topics in an informed ma manner. And this is one of the few recent books that gives us the New Delhi Kabul axis and does it very adroitly. Um, the last bit of the spiel is, of course, the book is a bargain 15 pounds tonight down from 35, once only opportunities. If you want to buy a copy, see me, and thank you again. Your Excellency, Mr. Senha, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you today, uh, especially an honor to be back to my, to a place I consider my second home, uh, SOAS, and uh, uh, also grateful to, to have the opportunity on this very particular occasion to come and celebrate the launch of a book about uh, a country or two countries that are very important in today's global politics, I, I would say, for all different reasons. Uh, we are here today to celebrate Dr. Avinash Baliwal's book, uh, My Enemy's Enemy, India and Afghanistan, From the Soviet Invasion to the U.S. Withdrawal. As you all uh, are aware, Afghanistan has gone through protracted years of war that is described in many different forms and ways. And one of the ways that Afghanistan conflict is described often is that this is a battlefield of many uh, other conflicts. The conflicts between the, the Russians or the Soviets and the US, the conflict between the US and Iran, the conflict between Iran in Saudi Arabia, the conflict, many other conflicts. So also uh, it is considered a place that is a con uh, the reflection of conflict between India and Pakistan. Uh, if you think through these lenses, you would, one would uh, kind of imagine that uh, stopping these kind of conflicts would, would practically result in, in a peace, uh, peaceful Afghanistan. Whether this is a, uh, solution or not, whether this question could be even uh, responded uh, positively or not, is really mu very much depending on the fact that the country has been a, in this particular phase of war for 40 years, and the complexity and the uh, difficulty of uh, finding a solution for it, for it will not be really responded by one or another solution of these conflicts or these kind of uh, uh, different dimensions that we discuss. So this is the really uh, time in which uh, Dr. Paliwal's book is an excellent contribution, where it at least unpacks one of these many dimensions uh, through looking at the history of uh, 
you know, Afghanistan and uh, India relations. This history is full of contradictory approaches and policies, as Dr. Palewal in his book explains. And at the same time, it is a, a, an important uh, reflection or a, an important document in the sense that it is based on evidences, something that we find really difficult in today's political world. People are making statements, making policies, drawing, you know, conclusions on countries and histories not really based on history. So Dr. Paliwal's book is a great contribution in that sense. So I will not take more of your time. You'll have this evening discussing the book by our great panelists uh, over here. But before I introduce the respected panelists for their contributions, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Uh, Avinash Paliwal to introduce the book. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Urzula, for the introduction, and thank you, Michael, for publishing, <laughs> publishing the book. There is no pressure whatsoever on me. Uh, I'm truly, truly honored um, to have such a distinguished panel this evening. All of them are leaders in their respective fields and represents a wonderfully diverse body of opinion and experience. Very fitting, I, I must say, for an institution such as SOAS, which revels in its diversity. Thank you, Your Excellency, High Commissioner Mr. Sinha, Thank you, Shashank. Thank you, Farzana. And thank you, Urzala, for taking the time out for this evening and for engaging with this book. Urzala today is here, you know, not just wearing two hats of both a chair and a panelist, but flew all the way from Kabul for the evening, among other things. Thank you, Urzala, for that. Uh, this event would not be possible without the support of the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy and the SOAS South Asia Institute. In particular, I would like to thank Dan, Dan Flesh and the stellar admin team of Raksha Bhandari and Richard Appleby. They were the muscle behind this, this event. Now, if any one of you read the title of this book and thought, one, this author is highly unimaginative, <laughs> and two, surely, for a country as big as India, when it is dealing with a neighborhood as complex as in Afghanistan and Pakistan, surely, I mean, it can't be as simple as my enemy's enemy, right? If you are thinking along these lines, please do read the book because uh, those 288 pages are full of primary source evidence which will prove you correct on both counts. <laughs> this book is a, is, it's a culmination of my doctoral and postdoctoral research at King's College London. And before I tell you what it is about, what its findings are, I think it's essential to tell what this book is not about. It is not a justification or blind praise of India's role in Afghanistan. If you, want to, if you want to know that, if you're looking for that, I would sincerely recommend following Indian media for that. Uh, and if you're looking for blank, blanket criticisms and rejection of India's presence in Afghanistan, then equally I would say you should follow the Pakistani media for that. Uh, and if you're looking for policy recommendations, uh, again, you know, I'm not answering those policy questions as to what India should do, what anyone else could do to get the region together, really, not, not, not in this book. This book simply shows what India did in Afghanistan. It explains why it did what it did. It teases out the implication of India's decisions and highlights what possibilities existed or were debated. And by doing that, the book not only fills a gap in literature on Indian foreign policy and South Asian strategic affairs, but also offers a building block to use India as a case towards developing disciplines of international relations and diplomatic history much more generally, and foreign policy analysis much more in particular. Now, last month, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, he announced his strategy towards Afghanistan. In one single speech, he castigated Pakistan for everything that is wrong in Afghanistan, pledged continuous American troops to presence uh, in Afghanistan without a timeline for withdrawal, made the subtitle of this book partly irrelevant, and put India on a pedestal for our, and asking it to do more. Now, let's be clear, this is a wartime decision, not one geared towards resolving the conflict, but more to ensure that US allies, US allies in and around Afghanistan continue to have a stronger, stronger, stronger hand against their adversaries. It was an admission that a conflict that has been raging for four decades has led to tremendous loss of life and capital, destroyed the social, economic, and political fabric of Afghanistan, is not ending anytime soon. It was an acknowledgment that India, 
a country that has not put a single boot on the ground and is not going to do so, they just announced, is very much part of this war. As we move, move forward trying to ascertain what impact India's increased presence in Afghanistan might have on the geopolitics of the region, and as we risk resigning ourselves into the trap of my enemy's enemy, this book seeks to take a look as to how we have reached here today and why so. Is containing Pakistan the key factor driving India's Afghanistan policy? That is the question, that is the central question that concerns this book. And the answer to my mind is no. Pakistan is a very important factor in India's Afghanistan policy, but containing Pakistan is not the be all and end all of this <clears throat> policy approach. There is a consensus in India that it wants to see a stable, sovereign, and territorially united Afghanistan. What India can do to achieve this goal is where the debate really begins. At one end of the spectrum are those who argue that all Afghan factions and political figures, uh, whether inside or outside the fold of the government, uh, that, stand, you know, that stand at odd with Pakistan or are not in the influence of or dependent on Pakistan should be India's allies or friends. If these friends are powerful, they hold power in Kabul, then brilliant. But if they don't, then India should do whatever it can to make them powerful. One way to empower them is to buttress their material capacities and mobilize international support in their favor. The other way to empower them is by making pro-Pakistan factions in Afghanistan relatively weak, by using covert or overt military means, whatever is required. All policymakers who subscribe to these views are termed partisans in this book. The other line of the argument at the other end uh, is that India should focus whoever comes to power in Kabul without fear or favor. And for this to happen, India should build goodwill among the people of Afghanistan and politically engage with every entity, regardless the militancy of their Islam in association with Pakistan's security agencies. Marked by pragmatism, not engaging with pro-Pakistan Afghan factions is not a viable option according to this line of thought, however difficult it might be in practice to both open and sustain such a dialogue. All those policy makers who broadly subscribe to this view are called conciliators in the book. Cutting across political and bureaucratic lines, the debate between partisans and conciliators is far, very far from being a strict binary. These are, both, these are broad analytical categories that allow unpacking strategy debates in India and are loaded with nuances depending on the case in point. Which of this advocacy then ends up influencing foreign policy output is determined by the interplay uh, between what I highlight as the three drivers of India's Afghanistan policy. The first and most important driver is India's desire to strike a strategic balance between Afghanistan and Pakistan. <clears throat> New Delhi does not want Pakistan to have an unduly strong uh, influence in Kabul, as it was assessed to be the case in late 1990s when the Taliban regime was there. But at the same time, it does not want Afghans to unnecessarily interfere in the affairs of Pakistan. This is a counterintuitive thought, but there is a, there is a good body of historical evidence suggesting the same. The second driver is the constantly evolving international political environment focused on Afghanistan. How does the US uh, respond to the idea of heightened Indian presence in Afghanistan? How did the Soviet Union view India's relationship with the Afghan communists? Uh, are Iran and Russia on the same page as India? Does United Kingdom's advocacy of reconciliation with the Afghan Taliban has many takers? How will China's increased political interest and involvement in Afghanistan impact India's options there? All these questions become important. And the third driver is the domestic politics of Afghanistan itself. Despite the goodwill that India enjoys among the people of Afghanistan, the situation at a political level is complicated. Simply, different Afghan political leaders and factions value India differently. A recent example was President Ashraf Ghani's audacious outreach towards Pakistan in 2014 and 15, seemingly at the expense of India. That, that the, Outreach expectedly failed is a different matter. What annoyed Indian policymakers considerably, although they tried putting a brave face at the time, was their knowledge that this outreach was more than just a political, political experiment. Rather, it was an exercise rooted perfectly in the history of bilateral relations between Afghanistan and Pakistan, regardless of India's relationship with either of these two countries. Interplay between these three drivers striking a balance between Afghanistan and Pakistan, constantly changing international political environment, and domestic Afghan politics determines who dominates India's Afghanistan policy, whether it is the partisans or the conciliators. Or for that matter, there is a compromise between the two. For example, 
It is known that during the 1965 India-Pakistan war, India ratcheted up its rhetoric on Pashtunistan, Balochistan, and East Pakistan. What is less appreciated is that the Afghan leadership was deeply reluctant in entertaining Indian desires to undermine the security and sovereignty of its eastern neighbor. It is known that Afghanistan in the 1970s, under the presidency of Daoud Khan, increased political, military, and financial support for Pashtun rebels inside Pakistan, eliciting a similar response from Pakistan who supported uh, various Islamists of various hues in Afghanistan. What is less known is that despite being sympathetic to the Pashtun cause, India rejected requests from Kabul for New Delhi to act in the East as Kabul acts in the West to quote unquote, take care of Pakistan. It is known that despite her reservations in private, Indira Gandhi publicly supported the Soviet intervention. What is less known is that her predecessor, Prime Minister Charan Singh, had categorically rejected Soviet actions both in public and in private. It is often asserted that in 1996, India staunchly opposed the Taliban along partisan lines. Yet, in 1992, India had welcomed the Mujahideen government in Kabul along conciliatory lines. In fact, there, is, there was coordination between India and Pakistan on the Afghan issue in the early 90s a time when Kashmir was witnessing its worst bout of separatist insurgency, which India held Pakistan responsible for. It is known that ever since 2001, Pakistan has accused India of using its consulates across Afghanistan to foment violence inside Pakistan. What is less, no less known is that during the composite dialogue between the two countries before 2008 Mumbai attacks, India offered Pakistan to undertake surprise checks on all Indian consulates in Afghanistan and ask for detailed readings of what Indians were doing there with the promise that India will not seek a quid pro quo. For its own reasons, Pakistan rebuffed the offer. More recently, since 2010, India kept arguing officially that there are no good or bad Taliban and that all such elements should be dealt with force. As this book demonstrates, on the ground and in internal policy discussions, India's approach has been far more nuanced. Now, clearly, there is good reason for Pakistan to be anxious. It is an anxiety that is exacerbated by the structural realities of the region and is historically apparent. There is an argument that resolving Kashmir would lead to an end of the Afghan war because, after all, it is the India-Pakistan rivalry which is at the heart of this war. A cursory look at this region's history will demonstrate that resolving Kashmir might assuage Pakistan's territorial anxieties and ambitions, perhaps even lead to a limited Indian presence in Afghanistan, but it is far from guaranteeing Kabul's acceptance of the Durand line as the legitimate border with Pakistan. The issue is that most existing literature and scholarship highlights phases of active partisanship and brands them as the rule. Historical evidence, however, points towards a much more complex reality that should force one to question both the intensity of India-Pakistan rivalry in Afghanistan and the strength of India-Afghanistan political relations, popular goodwill notwithstanding. Pakistan's attempts to limit India's role in Afghanistan has only increased, increased New Delhi's political will to deepen it, its footprint in that country. India welcomed Donald Trump's speech in Afghanistan. Now, this is unlikely because policymakers in Delhi think this strategy is a recipe for success, but more so because continuous American troop presence appeals to the central driver of India's Afghanistan policy, that is striking a strategic balance between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Trump's strong criticism of Pakistan might make one think that this is an approval for partisans in India. But United States' limited leverage over Pakistan, China's entry into the fray, and Russia and Iran's independent engagement with the Afghan Taliban might open avenues for a stronger, more creative, conciliatory response over time. The complexity of these relations really fascinated and terrified me when I was researching and writing this book. As the book concludes, if India can be an enemy across the Hindu Kush, as it has been, it can also be a friend who, appreciate, who appreciates Pakistan's territorial concerns and has little interest in exacerbating them. All I'll end this with is, I sincerely hope that you enjoy reading the book as much as I enjoyed writing it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Palival, for your very succinct uh, presentation of the book and uh, enlightening us with key findings uh, in analysis from the book. Uh, at this point, I would like to request uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador uh, Senha.
to uh, deliver their remarks. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador Sinha is a seasoned diplomat and during uh, a career of uh, spanning six, 36 years, he has handled several important assignments at the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, New Delhi in Indian, uh, and uh, in Indian diplomac uh, diplomacy in South Asia, Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, and permanent mission of India in the United Nations in New York. Um, uh, Ambassador Senha also uh, served uh, uh, as an additional secretary and headed the important Pakistan, Afghanistan, <coughs> Iran division at the Ministry of External Affairs. So without further ado, I, I would like to uh, request uh, His Excellency to express their remarks. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Paliwal, my fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here for this uh, launch of this book. My first visit to SOAS, and that's uh, perhaps my fault. I've been here long enough to have come earlier, but I couldn't have chosen a better uh, opportunity or occasion to come uh, than the release of this book. And uh, the reason why is that uh, I have been associated off and on uh, with Afghanistan for many years. And uh, I don't want to go into a lengthy um, uh, sort of exposition of my connections with uh, Afghanistan, and for that matter, Pakistan, but just to say that in 1992, I returned from Rome after being the first secretary commercial and economic, and suddenly I was sucked into what was then called the uh, IPA division, the Iran-Pakistan-Afghanistan division, as a deputy secretary looking after Pakistan, not Afghanistan. But since I had a colleague uh, sitting next to me, reporting to the same boss uh, position that I held later on, uh, obviously one uh, dealt at least peripherally with Afghan issues, and obviously you couldn't deal with Pakistan and not deal with Afghan issues, and vice versa. And then I find myself in 95 landing up as the head of the political section of the Indian High Commission in Islamabad. And what a time it was, 95 to 98. The Taliban had emerged from the seminaries of Samuel Haq's uh, uh, JUIS, if I remember correctly, if my memory serves me uh, correctly, uh, from the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa at that time, the NWFP, <coughs> and <coughs> sweep into Afghanistan, and then, of course, finally capture Kabul. Uh, of course, we had to evacuate our embassy, then I remember our uh, charge, uh, who was my colleague in the division before I went for Pakistan, uh, narrating incidents about that, but obviously I don't have time to narrate them to you. Um, and then I find myself in 98, uh, just an aside if I may, uh, I was the first Indian diplomat to actually meet Hamid Karzai when he was living in, in, in uh, Pakistan. But again, that is more for my memoirs and not, uh, not, for, not for this <laughs> evening. Um, and that was, I think, 96, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, in 98, I'll, I find myself in, uh, in, in, in New York at the permanent mission, uh, fresh out of you know, six years of Pakistan, three years in the ministry and three years uh, in, in, in the High Commission. And lo and behold, in a couple of years or three years, uh, there was 9-11, and suddenly, uh, Taliban became everybody's uh, curiosity. And I remember Ahmed Rashid's book, a very, very useful book that came out. It sold like hot cakes there. And I was suddenly invited to speak. Uh, and I was just a counselor, so I don't know why I was. Obviously, because I had some experience. I knew what the Taliban was. I invited to speak at various uh, think tanks and institutions, including at West Point, participate in a discussion on the Taliban. So I whatever little knowledge I had, I did try and share with, uh, with friends and colleagues there. But um, uh, what was interesting was that I, I actually uh, was not handling Afghanistan, uh, or for that matter, Pakistan, in, in the Indian mission to the UN. But obviously, given my interest and my experience, uh, I was often asked to cover for colleagues. Unfortunately, I was not sent to Bonn 1, much to my disappointment. Uh, but I did make up by attending Bonn 2 10 years later. Uh, in 2009, I came back and uh, headed the Afghanistan-Pakistan-Iran division uh, for four years almost as Joint Secretary and Additional Secretary. <clears throat> so a lot of what is written in this book, particularly in that period from 2009 and, 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 uh, to 2013, I have been per personally witness to. Um, and of course, what is written before is something that I have peripherally, uh, peripherally followed. Um, when I read this book, 
uh, I kept debating whether I was uh, a conciliator or, or a partisan. And at some points of time, I said, perhaps as per Dr. Palewal's division, I'd fit into one or the other. But when I finished the book, I was very confused. I didn't, I still can't make out whether I, am, I, I come in one or the other category. But having said that, he very clearly clarified, and he did so just now also, that it's not a binary approach, it's a very fluid categorization. So I let that rest there and perhaps grapple with my own demons and come to the conclusion of whether I was, uh, I am a partisan or a conciliator. But um, one thing is very clear that uh, obviously Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan are three sides of a triangle. Uh, and for any peace in Afghanistan, naturally, India and Pakistan need to work together. And that's precisely why I think Dr. Palewal mentioned in the composite dialogue, I was very much <coughs> involved in the various editions of the composite dialogue. In fact, I was involved since 98 when the working groups uh, were set up uh, between India and Pakistan and then participated in successive uh, meetings on, on, on whether it's Siachen, Sir Creek, trade, Kashmir, name it, and I was there, terrorism. So I did all that. And I remember at that time, we were very keen to engage Pakistan on Afghanistan so that we could allay their fears about, uh, you know, any sort of containment or encircle encirclement, which was obviously not what we wanted. So much so that we even wanted to allay their fears regarding the so-called strategic depth, which I think, if I remember correctly, it was General Mirza Aslam Beg who first came out with this theory or, or this, uh, this policy, if I may put it that way, which has really influenced Pakistan's uh, yeah, policy towards Afghanistan. And as far as India is concerned, and I'm not going into the title or into the three drivers of Indian foreign policy, because it's, it's obviously very clear uh, the way it has been stated. But uh, what I would like to say is that, that the amount of men in terms of people who have worked on projects in Afghanistan, projects that I have personally supervised, whether it was the Salma Dam. I remember visiting the so-called India-Afghan, Afghan-India Friendship Dam, which was inaugurated last year. Uh, or was it, I mean, I, I personally traveled to, I remember it was, it was really hazardous. I, I, I went in July 2011 uh, to Chishte Sharif. Now, Chishte Sharif, for those of you who don't know, is a very important Sufi. Uh, center and a lot of the Chishti, the Sufi saints came from there and Salma Dam is somewhere there, 160 kilometers from Herat and I remember flying in an old Russian ME-17 helicopter without doors and machine guns mounted on them and the pilot saying we'll fly treetop because the Taliban by the time they pick up their weapons you would have passed them but anyway it was uh, not a very uh, enjoyable experience as you can imagine but <laughs> India has invested a lot uh, in Afghanistan, 2.6, 2.7. When I was there, it was $2.3 billion. Now it's prob probably more. And we have built some seminal infrastructure projects there. And I think this book does touch upon that. For instance, the Zaranj Dilaram Highway. Now that highway was built at great cost. People lost their lives building that, that, uh, that highway. How important that highway is, it connects to the garland uh, of roads in Afghanistan. Uh, and in the future, when Chabahar comes up and when there is a connection, we will realize how important that route will be in, in, in connecting uh, Chabahar to uh, Afghanistan and uh, to the rest of Afghanistan. In fact, I even traveled on that road from Chabahar towards Iran Shahar in November 2011. Obviously, I did only 20, 25 kilometers uh, along with some people to see how, what we can do. And I think it's, that is why that because of the problems we are facing, for instance, there's a reference to, or not in this book, but I remember the supply of wheat uh, to Afghanistan. India has supplied a huge amount of wheat over the years. And I remember uh, during my uh, tenure in Delhi, uh, we were unable to supply uh, uh, wheat through Pakistan. So we entrusted some biscuits, high energy biscuits, high protein biscuits, uh, for schools, this is meant for school children, primary school children, um, to the WFP, the World Food Program, who then of course liaised with the Pakistan government and some of it uh, went through Karachi and up 
all the way through the Khyber Pass and uh, through to Afghanistan. But um, uh, I remember that at that time we were told, remove the Indian flag or a gift from the people of India, etc., etc., because that won't go down well. Uh, but I, what I'm trying to say is that the investment that <coughs> India has made has been tremendous, whether it's the Afghan <coughs> parliament, whether it is bringing electricity to Kabul after about 13 or 14 years uh, from, uh, Uzbek, from, from Uzbekistan, the, uh, through mountainous territory, if I remember correctly, uh, it sort of connected from, uh, we did two substations in Charikar and, and Pule Kumri, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and brought electricity for the first time uh, to, to Kabul after the war. Uh, in, uh, I mean, the, the, the sort of humanitarian work, the sort of development assistance that we've done was actually for me an eye-opener because we didn't have a development partnership administration till 2011. From 2009 to 2011, the territorial division that I was in charge of actually ran this operation through our embassy and through our consulates. So it was actually, a, 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 I think, tremendous achievement to try and to deliver on time. Of course, there were delays. There were huge cost overruns. The Salma Dam, I remember I was told by a Russian colleague in Moscow that you will never be able to complete it. We tried and failed. So it was a matter of great pride that despite the huge cost overruns and time overruns, we, we, we were able to complete that dam. And it only produces 42 megawatts of electricity, but it does irrigate or uh, the land there. The Iranians were very suspicious of what we were doing, perhaps blocking the Harikud River, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that's all memory, so <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we had to allay their apprehensions. Uh, so we've actually worked across the board in Afghanistan. And there were no special areas that we'd like to work. People would like to think that since we were alienated from the south to the east, from the Pashtuns. We did work only uh, in the north or in the areas controlled by the erstwhile Northern Alliance. That is not correct. For instance, we started the small development project, which is a great innovation that we had done in Nepal and in Afghanistan, and which, as High Commissioner of Sri Lanka, I introduced there. And these are the typically quick gestation projects, which are less than a million dollars, or even much less sometimes, a very small project like building tube wells, building primary health centers, culverts, small bridges, etc., uh, which was so successfully implemented in Nepal, Afghanistan, and then, then Sri Lanka, and now we're doing it elsewhere too. And these projects made a material difference to the lives of the people there. The people in the rural areas, people living in s small communities who had been scarred uh, by decades of, of conflict. And that is why when I remember uh, the consecutive polls, I don't know, I'm, I'm, you can doubt the veracity of those polls, but they were done by, uh, not Indians, certainly, uh, by international uh, media organizations, uh, where India was viewed very favorably, not by one, two, or three sections of the society, but right across Afghanistan. And if I remember, the uh, approval rating was way above 75%. And India was number one, ahead of uh, the United States. Ahead, and this is despite the fact that the US and the ISAF and the, uh, the NATO had sunk in so much blood and treasure uh, in Afghanistan. India was always consistently rank one, followed by other countries, US, UK, uh, Germany, etc. And obviously, Pakistan didn't rate very high. But I'm not going into that because that is something that the, the pollsters and the Afghan people need to be asked. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not a zero-sum game. I think I've been quoted twice in this book. I, I, uh, I, I see, thanks to WikiLeaks, I've even featured there. <laughs> and, and I, I remember, uh, and I shouldn't be saying this, but I remember playing golf in Delhi one, uh, just when WikiLeaks broke. And my colleague, who is the Deputy High Commissioner in London, rings me up on my mobile and actually spoils my swing and says, Yash, you become famous or infamous, you're on WikiLeaks. I said, oh my God, am I going to lose my job? He says, no, you, you come out smelling like roses. <laughs> and then I got two birdies and, and, and a par after that. But anyway, so um, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what I've tried to say is that it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, India and Pakistan, and I've told you how I've dealt with Pakistan for so many years. I have so many friends there. I've uh, indulged in uh, 
very heated and not so heated, very nice discussions with them on a host of issues, including Kashmir. But uh, on Afghanistan, there is a general agreement that unless the region as a whole works, and obviously the two principal countries there, apart from Afghanistan, which is the subject of our discussion, are India and Pakistan. And so this whole Heart of Asia initiative, which, uh, which was uh, there when I participated right from the beginning, and the first few meetings right up to, I think, uh, Almaty, or, or sorry, even just Tana, Almaty, the last meeting I attended, uh, I participated in so many of these meetings where everybody expected that India and Pakistan would talk. But obviously, talking in a multilateral context by agreeing to a communique is something else, but by actually working together bilaterally and discussing it makes far more sense. So I've always been of the opinion that it's not a zero-sum game. And uh, if we have to, for instance, we were accused of having 64 consulates in Afghanistan. I'm going to say, I think that's absurd. You ask the Afghan government how many do we have, we have four. And they are very sparsely manned. And I mean, the sort of stuff that they've been accused of doing, uh, they could never have done. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, my, my, my reaction to this is, book is that it's not too late. And I think even now, if India and Pakistan are able to talk uh, through Afghanistan, on Afghanistan, work together, not just India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, but all the regional countries, it would help immensely. But for that, and I must add a rider, because the bilateral dialogue is stalled basically on the issue of terrorism. And that is an extremely important issue. Just the day before, our permanent representative in New York has asked for sanctions against funding of terrorist activity in, 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 Pakistan, in Afghanistan. Now, we have always been maintaining that unless you clean the swamp, clear the swamp, that exists in that region and, and determinedly, unitedly confront the menace of terrorism, I'm afraid there will be no solution to uh, this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency Ambassador Sanha, for a very uh, comprehensive uh, discussion and remarks, particularly high highlighting some of the reflections on on how this can proceed further um, at this point i would like to request um, our uh, panelist uh, dr farzana sheikh uh, as most of you probably uh, know dr farzana sheikh she's an outstanding scholar and um, associate fellow of the royal institute of international affairs chatham house in london and a foreign policy expert on Afghanistan and Afghanistan, uh, in Pakistan. Sorry, twice. Um, Dr. Farzana Sheikh uh, lectured at uh, different universities in the UK, US, and Europe, and has published widely on the history and politics of Pakistan and its relations with its neighbors. Uh, her most recent book, Making Sense of Pakistan, published by uh, Hearst, was selected by The Guardian in 2002 as one of the four essential books on Pakistan and Afghanistan for the British government. Uh, without further ado, I would like to request uh, Dr. Sheikh to have their remarks. Thank you, Arzada. And my thanks to, to the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy here at SOAS for inviting me this evening to help launch this impressive new book by Avinash. Let me begin by observing, though it hardly needs saying, just how prescient this book has turned out to be. In fact, I asked myself, what did Avinash and his publisher, Michael Dwyer at Hearst, know that we didn't, when they so cannily decided to time the publication of this book to coincide with President Trump's provocative call for India to do more in Afghanistan triggering a furious response from Pakistan, whose prime minister declared last week that he saw zero role for India in Afghanistan. Not surprisingly, the storm generated has left everyone talking, though it must be said, not always with curtsy, as was witnessed last week at the UN General Assembly, where India and Pakistan traded unseemly insults over each other's alleged complicity in using Afghanistan 
to foment terrorism. In this climate of unbridled hostility, we have never been in greater need for sober voices to step forward and restore calm. This thoughtful contribution by Avinash more than rises to the occasion. His judicious expose of India's Afghan policy since the late 1970s, peopled by a dizzying cast of characters, gives us an exceptionally well-balanced and carefully calibrated analysis of the pressures facing one of Asia's most important rising powers. And while he is acutely sensitive to the structural constraints that have frustrated India's Afghan policy over the last four decades or so, he is also admirably well-placed to demonstrate the vast room for maneuver and scope for agency enjoyed by Indian policymakers in crafting that policy. Indeed, his access to key players at the highest levels of India's policymaking establishment, which would make any researcher green with envy, leaves us in no doubt that India can and does enjoy considerable freedom of choice when deciding its foreign policy options in Afghanistan, even if their outcomes have often been molded in line with the conflicting policy narratives of those Avinash defines as conciliators and partisans. In two, 10 short minutes, it is difficult to do justice to this fine study. So let me pick up briefly on a couple of points that arise from my reading of Abhinash's book. The first takes issue, though entirely in the spirit of constructive criticism, over the question of what really drives India's Afghan policy. The second is more of an observation about the omission of the role of South Asian regional organizations as potential interlocutors of India's Afghan policy. With regard to the first, I think it is fair to say that if there is one consistent thread running through this book, it is the claim that India's Afghan policy is not driven by the imperative of containing Pakistan. Rather, we are told, it is to ensure a balance between Pakistan and Afghanistan. What this means, Avinash explains, is that India's policy in Afghanistan is largely informed by the desire to avoid an imbalance in the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan, which is seen to be both destabilizing for the region and in conflict with India's interests. The point is well taken, but only, I fear, at the level of abstraction. In practice, it is to disregard what has been and remains arguably the most important driver of regional politics since 1947, namely the question of the balance between India and Pakistan, rooted in Pakistan's historic claim to parity with India. I would maintain that it is in fact Pakistan's claim to parity with India that has encouraged it to, as it were, take charge of Afghanistan. A move that Indian policymakers have chosen to misread as an attempt by Pakistan to skew the balance in its favor, <clears throat> in its dealings with Afghanistan, rather than correcting Pakistan's fundamental imbalance with India. I can think of no better example of this than Pakistan's irritation over being consistently twinned with Afghanistan as an Afbak rather than paired with India. So, while there is no denying the complex and many-layered quality of India's Afghan policy, and Avinash is to be commended for bringing this to our attention, it behooves us as scholars to be cautious before treating the historic and, dare I say, enduring rivalry between India and Pakistan as little more than an ideational variable 
that policymakers would have us believe plays little or no part in their calculations. My second point concerns the role of South Asian regional organizations as potential interlocutors of India's Afghan policy. While Avinash does an excellent job of showing us how Pakistan has effectively silenced India's voice on a post-war settlement for Afghanistan by systematically excluding it from discussions at the global level when not marginalizing it from trans-regional organizations such as the Istanbul process, I did wonder why India had failed to mobilize regional bodies, however modest, such as the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, otherwise known as SARC, closer to home, where it could have expected a hearing from regional partners with a stake in Afghanistan. This seems to me to be all the more surprising, given that Afghanistan has been a member of SARC since 2007, and that India, as SARC's dominant member, has made no secret of its interest in expanding South Asia's energy and trade links with Central Asia through Afghanistan. If, as Avinash argues, India's policy towards Afghanistan is not simply about fighting proxy wars <laughs> with Pakistan, then we need to know why regional initiatives closer to home to break the deadlock over Afghanistan have failed to receive more attention from India's policymakers. Of course, there are hurdles. Afghanistan brings to SARC the baggage of its unresolved dispute with Pakistan over the Durand line, about which India is keen to maintain its neutrality, while India must be mindful of Pakistan's profound misgivings about India's motives in steering the course of South Asian regionalism. Nevertheless, it would be curious indeed if Indian policymakers, both partisans and conciliators, were altogether oblivious to the opportunities presented by balancing bilateralism with regionalism in South Asia. In conclusion, let me say once again that I would like to extend my very warmest congratulations to Avinash for this fine study, which I'm sure is set to take its place as a definitive account in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, uh, Dr. Uh, Sheikh. Uh, uh, at this point in time, I would like to request our other uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Shashank Joshi, uh, who is a, a senior research fellow at the Royal United Service Institute in London. He holds degrees from Cambridge and Harvard and uh, has been known for its wide publications um, across different journals and uh, media outlets, including um, Asian security issues and journals and strategic studies, Asian affairs, Asia survey, Asian survey, and the Washington Quarterly. His book, Indian Power Projection, Ambitions, Arms, and Influence, was published as a Rusi Whitehall paper in 2015, in December 2015. Uh, Mr. Shishan Joshi, the thank panel you. is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to my fellow panelists. First of all, let me just say what an outstanding book this is. Um, I recently read a couple of books by uh, practitioners. I read uh, Shishan Kamenin's book last year, Choices. Uh, he was India's national security advisor and, and foreign secretary. Um, and then a few months ago, I read Sham Saran's book, uh, How India Sees the World, also an account of contemporary Indian foreign policy. They both have very good sections on their respective uh, perspectives as practitioners engaging with, uh, in Menon's case, particularly China, in Saran's case, Nepal uh, and China as well. Um, but really, in the corpus of writing on Indian foreign policy in the last several years, um, I think a book like this really stands out for me um, because of its rigor and its depth. 
and it's something that you very rarely see in discussions of a subject like this. There's volumes written on India and Afghanistan, but of course very little of it rises to the level of scholarship like this. And I think the reason for that is that Avinash has done the hard work of interviewing a very wide range of people, uh, whether voluntarily or in, in the High Commissioner's case involuntarily from <laughs> courtesy of Julian Assange, um, in a really comprehensive and impressive way. Um, not only that, I think um, uh, mining a range of sources beyond the diplomatic that I'll get onto in a second, that I think is crucial to understanding India's regional diplomacy as well. So congratulations, Avinash. I think this is an absolutely outstanding book on, on contemporary Indian foreign policy uh, that stands head and shoulders above a lot else that's been written on this. Um, just a few, a few scattered thoughts, since my fellow panelists have said uh, most of the substantive things that need to be said. First of all, on this uh, uh, dominating thematic framework of partisans versus conciliators. I think it's really interesting because it gets to a point about foreign policy for all countries, not just for India and Afghanistan, but for any country orienting its foreign policy, particularly in a contentious, uh, you know, conflictual state where uh, political factions are rising and falling, where there is no sort of guarantee that the uh, you know, party in charge today will be in charge in a stable, predictable way in five years' time. Um, this fundamental dilemma is always there. Do you pick friends, pick winners and back them to the hilt, or do you hedge your bets? And how do you balance those two competing priorities? And of course, it's a, it's a spectrum, but this is a really um, sort of perennial problem in foreign policy faced by all states operating in, in, in environments like this. Now, he's very even-handed about the way he adjudicates this debate between these factions or these groupings in Indian foreign policy. But the way I read it, and he'll correct me if I've misread this, is that the, the theme seems to be that Indian efforts to pick winners in Afghanistan has repeatedly seen it get burnt uh, and, and emerge with its fingers scathed. Um, and he talks about the drivers of who comes out on top in these Indian debates, and he's, he's outlined that as being uh, Afghan domestic politics, the international political environment, and this balance between Afghanistan and Pakistan, not wishing, actually not wishing to go all out on containing Pakistan. But I think from the way I saw it, those efforts to pick winners, when the partisans were on top, when the people who said, here are our friends in Afghanistan, here is who we must support, here is who we must back to the hilt, whenever India has done that, it's been burnt, first of all, by political changes domestically in Kabul, over which it had very little control, sometimes in very dram dramatic and violent fashion, like the fall of Najibullah, um, by international political changes, changes in the international environment, uh, where the entire international approach to the conflict has changed, as it did in the 2000s, when the international community decided actually reconciliation with Taliban, uh, and um, uh, reintegration at the ground level with Taliban foot soldiers and reconciliation at the higher level is the way to go. And that was a change over which uh, uh, India was perhaps uh, uh, sort of um, uh, caught in a reactive situation. But I think third, most of all, most importantly of all, the reason that partisanship, in, that's the way Avinash has framed it, has got India burned, is because it hasn't had the means to ensure the survival of its allies or friends. Uh, and that's, that's not unique to India. That, that is a problem that the great powers have had as well. Um, but it's certainly a problem that India has had. Uh, it's ultimately a problem of limited capability. And I think as he shows that, he delves into some interesting areas of history uh, 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 with a sort of not revisionist accounts, but certainly new accounts. Uh, what I found very interesting was his argument that in the 90s, a period we associate with India extending its support for anti-Taliban forces with the Northern, uh, backing the Northern Alliance alongside Iran and Russia. Uh, Abinash argues that there was no guarantee of India's sustained military support to Massoud, to Ahmed Shah Massoud, the, the Panjshiri leader in the North, uh, had, if 9-11 had not happened. Uh, he shows how the Uzbeks were wavering uh, and expelled Northern Alliance leaders from their soil. He shows that Indian capabilities at this point were actually very, very small, were very limited in their ability to dramatically change the situation on the ground. He quotes Lalit Mansingh, a former Indian Foreign Secretary, as saying, India by itself cannot play a major role in the security situation 
of Afghanistan, uh, a fact primarily determined by geography, by supply lines, by the fact that it requires the acquiescence of either the uh, Central Asian states or Iran to be able to uh, supply large, uh, um, in, uh, supply Afghan friends and allies with substantial amounts of support. I think this is very interesting in the contemporary context because, of course, India now faces a situation where its allies from the 1990s, Iran and Russia, have dramatically different positions vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan than they did in a way that, again, constrains India's ability to project power and force into Afghanistan, notwithstanding the very substantial aid and development footprint that was outlined earlier in a meaningful way. Iran has engaged uh, increasingly with Afghan Taliban leaders, as it always did, but now does so in a much more far-reaching strategic way, um, uh, hedging its own bets, uh, supporting key Taliban factions as the organization has splintered over the years. Um, Russia, of course, has also um, uh, uh, now uh, allegedly armed some factions of the Taliban, or at the very least uh, engaged with factions in a more positive, open way, again, not only with an eye on, on uh, pushing back against the US presence, but also hedging its own bets. And so India's own ability to intervene and to play a substantial security role in the way that it did, to convey lethal assistance over Iranian ground and airspace has changed. And I think that question of pragmatists versus conciliators is shaped by this limited capacity and this limited risk tolerance at that level. And again, we saw this two days ago with India's defense secretary, uh, two, two or three days ago, Indian, um, uh, the new Indian defense uh, minister, um, uh, in her meeting with uh, Secretary James Mattis, the US Secretary of Defense, categorically ruling out any Indian boots on the ground uh, uh, and signals that even India's posture on lethal assistance would be very, very cautious. The second point on this subject of partisans versus conciliators is I'd be really interested in I'm actually drawing you out on, on, on where you stand on this, because um, I said a little bit on the partisans, but on the conciliators, you're actually also quite harsh on um, a, lot of the con a lot of their ability to successfully juggle these various balls in handling their links with different Afghan factions. And I think you have a, a section where you say, um, um, the conciliators engage with all approach, yielded limited results at best, and confused many and alienated some Afghans at worst. Now, um, the High Commissioner mentioned uh, development assistance, and of course in your book you talk a little bit about how the geography of India's development assistance, uh, concentrated in, one, in cer certainly one period in Pashtun areas, managed to alienate and provoke uh, many of India's traditional friends in northern communities. And it, you sort of you feel sympathetic for Indians trying to juggle that relationship at this point with Hamid Karzai, because um, you wonder how they could have handled that much better. This was the period in w at which they were trying to branch out. They were trying to engage with Hamid Karzai in the early 2000s, despite a great deal of skepticism from the partisans, saying, no, we must uh, maintain a weighting of support for our traditional friends in the uh, uh, sort of in northern communities. Um, and even in that period, if the conciliators couldn't manage it then, when did they manage it? So I guess what I'm asking is, in your view, who got it right? Who successfully balanced it? Uh, because you, you, you're on the fence, and as a good scholar, you're also perhaps right to be. But we you know, flush you out here and you know, tell us, uh, uh, when was it at its most successful uh, throughout this period? Because I'm really interested. Um, just a, a final point in the last couple of minutes I, I have. I think one of the great things about this book is that it, it, it gives due weight to you know, what has been called the missing dimension in international history, which is intelligence. Um, and this is a very difficult subject for anyone, any scholar to work on, given the lack of archives, the difficulty of sourcing, the sensitivity of these issues. Um, but it would be very, very difficult to write a book on this issue without due weight to intelligence. Just as you could not write a meaningful history of international involvement in Afghanistan in the 80s without a di intelligence dimension. You know, books like Steve Cole's Ghost Wars and others, they couldn't be written without uh, due attention to what the CIA uh, and other organizations were doing. Similarly, I don't think you could write a book like this without uh, due attention to what uh, the Indian intelligence perspective was. Very, very difficult to do, but I think you've tried your very best to do it. Um, now, this is interesting not only historically in terms of India's involvement with Baloch uh, and Pashtun separatists, on which you give, I think, a very rigorous but fair-minded 
uh, and, and sensitive uh, appraisal, but also contemporary developments. Uh, you, you, you talk um, about uh, um, uh, India's uh, ramping up support for um, uh, um, was it Baloch groups in, after, during the Kargil period under Narayanan, uh, M.K. Narayanan's India's National Security Advisor? Uh, it, was, it was basically in Afghanistan when they really started backing all the different factions within the Northern Alliance fold, and then, however it transpired, uh, this was aimed towards kind of uh, drawing some balance in the, during the Kargil War is when, 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 you know. Sure. With the Baloch, yes. I mean, th there has been different points in time when that support has been being given allegedly and, so. and, you, and you draw that out very well over the full period again after the the bombing of the Indian Embassy in Kabul in 2008 uh, uh, Avinash uh, talks in a, in a, in a uh, about how uh, MK Narayanan reached out to Amrullah Saleh at that time the Indi uh, Afghan intelligence chief to assess possibilities of jointly targeting militant infrastructure in Pakistan and there's a whole chapter I think which gives a really rigorous uh, uh, and as I say sensitive not at all sensationalist account of India's handling of these uh, issues and particularly how to handle uh, Pashtun and Baloch communities uh, including by drawing upon uh, diaspora diaspora communities uh, drawing on relationships with the Afghan government uh, and others this is a profoundly difficult subject because it's so shrouded in a morass of national propaganda uh, uh, and wild claims but I think you've done a really good job of teasing this out, including interviews with uh, people who served on India's Joint Intelligence Committee, uh, Indian intelligence officials who held senior roles uh, uh, in, the, in the Afghan portfolio. Um, and I think that that's really important both in giving us a more nuanced, accurate account beyond the wild 64 consulates getting up to all kinds of nonsense uh, on the one hand, and of course on the other hand, this, this view that in certain circles that India uh, is whiter than white and is a pacifist state would, would never dream of uh, uh, doing anything coercive in, in, the, in the neighborhood. Uh, and of course that is, that is also n not an accurate and balanced portrayal. So you've done a really good job of that. And that allows you to take a, a, a pragmatic appraisal of the way in which India's relationship to uh, the Taliban itself evolved after 2010. And despite the rhetoric, which I, which I think at times did get rather sanctimonious about how there are no good or bad Taliban and the West doesn't understand this and other Western countries don't get this, but actually uh, I think there's a, a, a very interesting and detailed um, exposition of India's own cautious uh, and contentious within Delhi outreach to different Taliban factions after 2010 and the impact that had. And I just wonder, maybe you could say for us at the end, I'll, I'll wrap up now, on how you think India will handle this issue, because clearly um, uh, the, the uh, US policy that, that uh, uh, Fazana mentioned has come with an emphasis. The, the US still seeks a diplomatic and a political solution. And I wonder if you think how this will actually translate uh, into India pressing for its own concerns. What, what will be its particular red lines and, and uh, 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 national interest as that uh, 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 issue comes back to the fore again after a period in which it's been uh, uh, greatly uh, subsided. Thank you. Thank you very much.